Hi, welcome to another edition of the Joe Klein Memorial Lecture here at, at Guilford Tech. Um, we've got a great talk in store for you tonight. A few announcements before we get started. Um, the clouds are here, but they're not completely over overspreading us. So we're still pretty certain that we won't have an observing session tonight after the talk. But we'll have to check. I'll, uh, some of our volunteers are over here. They're going to assess the skies towards the end of the talk, and we'll we'll have an announcement. Um, if we are going to observe, we'll let you know. But I would assume no, because there's plenty more rain and clouds to the east of us uh, moving this way. But if you um, can't come and observe with us tonight, we're open every clear Friday night all year long. Um, so during March through October, we start basically as darkness falls. Um, and then during November through February, we start at seven. So watch for clear skies, come out, look through our telescopes. We have uh, a great program. We'll show you lots of things, tell you what you're looking at. Um, you may have seen on the, on the, um, the rotating slideshow before um, that we have a couple of upcoming events. We've got another speaker coming on October 13th in this very room, Anthony Love from Appalachian State University, the other ASU. Um, is going to come and give a talk about uh, mineralogy of meteorites and how that tells us about the history of the solar system. So uh, another Friday night talk coming up next month. And then the day after that is the solar eclipse. And we plan to have uh, an open observing session out in the parking lot just up here outside the building um, up on the upper level. We we'll have lots of safe solar telescopes and viewers, and uh, of course it has to be clear skies, but we plan to be observing if you want to come out and look at the solar eclipse with us. Um, the time frame for that is between about 11 o'clock in the morning and 3 in the afternoon. Okay. Um, we also have, if now remember, you shouldn't stare at the sun, so during the eclipse you have to have safe solar viewers. You can get safe solar viewers either from us at the observatory on Fridays or from our campus stores. So um, if you come by our bookstores, they have them on sale there for $2. So if you're interested in that and want to, to find out how to do that or more about that, see me after the talk. Also, those of you who are in the astronomy classes here at Guilford Tech, You've got a little assignment sheet that you're supposed to fill out. There'll be a box in the lobby where you'll um, drop a sheet in at the end of the talk, and then you've got to do the rest of the assignment. So I'm sure you know what that is from your courses. We do plan to have a um, question and answer session at the end of the talk. Um, so please, once the main part of the talk is over, don't rush the doors. Um, if you do need to leave early, there are back doors out in the back and you can take the stairs or the elevator back down to the lobby. Um, but we, we expect from just past um, Joe Klein lectures that we'll have plenty of questions at the end. And so we wanna make sure we have um, a nice session for, for people to ask those questions. <clears throat> um, I also want to, to recognize as always this, night wouldn't be possible without uh, two special families, the Martins and the Kleins. And uh, we have members of both of those families here, Don Klein and Aaron Aruz Martin. Aaron is my predecessor here at Guilford Tech. He had the vision to build this program and to, to build an observatory, to have these public lectures. And Don Klein, when they got together, um, the magic happened and now we have all of this. And I know Don and Aaron used to go years ago to American Astronomical Society meetings and l listen to all those talks and figure out who the really good speakers were. And we, we have such an amazing speaker here tonight because we have a long tradition started by them 26 years ago um, when we had our first lecture with Bruce Carney from Chapel Hill, but then they, um, they started going for the big time. They got John Wood who, um, gave a Hubble talk. Well, this is sort of next generation Hubble with a new level of what Hubble is. And then the first one of these I came to before I worked here was Bob Kirshner, 
um, in uh, 1999. And then, then Virginia Trimble and uh, the, the list just went on and on. We've had a lot of great speakers here. And this year, for the first time in a few years, we're, we're back in the room and, and having the speaker present to us in person. So um, we're really happy to uh, to be back here with another great talk for the Joe Klein uh, Memorial Series. So our speaker, his name is Roger Windhorse. He's from Arizona State University. He um, got his professional degrees in Leiden in the Netherlands, um, studying radio galaxies, and then came to the US as a postdoc working in Pasadena at, at the Carnegie Observatories and at Caltech, where he hooked up with the effort to build the first uh, cameras for the Hubble Space Telescope, the wide field planetary camera, the first one. And um, since then, he's been um, sort of intimately connected with Hubble. He's used all its instruments and had over 80 funded proposals working with just numerous astronomers from all over the world. He was here earlier today in a, in a, a, a Zoom conference. Uh, he was telling me his current team has scientists in 18 time zones. And so you can imagine how uh, what an ordeal that is to get everybody on the same page. Um, but um, he moved from HST to JWST, so um, he became one of six interdisciplinary scientists for, for the web. And he explained to us um, earlier today that that basically is, is the group of people who make sure that everything gets done right. And everything did seem to get done right because you're going to see tonight some pretty amazing images and hear about some pretty amazing science. And I hope you got a chance to look at the images that are out in the hall. If not, be sure to look at them on the way out. So let me turn things over to our speaker and let him tell you a little bit about James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you all. It's a great honor to be here. Um, let me make sure that the talk comes back. It's asked me for wireless, but we don't need that. Um, how many of you were here for John Mather's talk, the JWST project scientist in uh, 2017? A number of folks, but um, not the majority of the audience. So then I will not hesitate to say a bit more about what the web telescope is. If anybody, um, oh, it's just turned off. Hang on. something happened. Let there be dark. <laughs> now let there be light. Uh, let's see. Interesting. I may have to. Hearing is connected and we saw it for a minute. Let me reshare the screen. Well, it is true that the web telescope works. It constantly wants attention for the wireless. Maybe the first thing I should do is turn the wireless off. Give me a minute. And maybe that's interfering with the operations. I apologize for that. Um, we go here and we turn the wireless off. That might help. Um, now let's reconnect it and see if it revives. Um, Show this screen, so we'll ah, yeah, it, it will come back to the other thing, yeah. which is OK. But we learned this afternoon how to fix that. We can get rid of this thing. Well, yeah, OK, good. At least now we have. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, ah, it refreshes too. All right, so the world of web and seeing through the eyes of Einstein. Um, as um, Tom said a large number of collaborators over 18 time zones. I won't name them all. I do want to say that this lecture is indeed in, in honor and memory of Joe Klein. Um, um, and, and thanks to um, Don for having these uh, wonderful nights and all the folks that have organized this. Uh, Joe has been soaring high on her air balloons and tonight we're going to soar high on the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. 
So this is an image of the North Ecliptic Pole time domain field. If the planetary systems, planets go around the sun in the ecliptic, far up north and far up south is a spot that Webb can observe, the only spot that Webb can observe 365 days a year. In the south, that spot is interesting because there is a small galaxy there called the Large Magellanic Cloud. In the north, it's an empty spot and you can observe it at any angle and see which objects are moving like stars. Um, some do move uh, like brown dwarfs or which objects vary like supernovae or the uh, centers of galaxies where black holes reside. So the program for tonight, and I'll try not to go over time, the web project has already gone over time in the last 20 years. I don't want to repeat that tonight. So I'll keep it as short as possible, but I got a lot of charge. So we'll talk about the web telescope, th th one th first one third of the talk, the current status, uh, how it came about, uh, because most of you weren't here seven years ago when John Mather spoke. He was my boss for many years. Um, then we talk about Webb's first in images, the cosmic circle of life, as I call it. And then the last but not least, we'll talk about viewing the universe through the eyes of Einstein, as I promised. Um, then we'll come at my summaries and conclusions. I know a lot of you will have questions about other things, including supermassive black holes. So I've stuck that in the spare charts in case there's a lot of questions about it. I won't talk much about that. This is just for bonus. But the whole talk is available here in case you want to pull it over and Tom can send you that link around. I want to start with a warning that in the last 30 years, 33 years to be precise, asking NASA for Hubble data has been like taking a sip from a fire hydrant. Yeah, the last one year um, has been more like, uh, whoops, um, taking a sip from the Niagara Falls, if you ask Webb for NASA data. It's overwhelming. It's been completely overwhelming. So children, please don't do this at home, but it feels like that. And the talk will feel a little bit like that too. So Mr. Hubble, was the uh, Carnegie astronomer, as you may know, that found the Hubble expansion in the late 20s and when the Hubble telescope was conceived in the 70s, built in the 80s, uh, launched in 1990. And I heard last week in Baltimore, it may run for another 10 years. So that's a conservative estimate. It may go to the end of this decade and longer. So named after the man who uh, discovered the expansion of the universe. The Webb telescope is named after the second NASA administrator, Jim James Webb, who um, <clears throat> was working with JFK um, to accomplish the moon mission. And um, that was an interesting conversation in the White House. The tapes are available that Mr. Kennedy um, said to Mr. Webb, well, I don't actually care about going to the moon. I just want to beat the Russians. And Mr. Webb said, no, Mr. President, if we go there, we need to find out what's on the moon. So he was the one that invented space science. He made it happen. That's why the telescope is named after him. So the Hubble mirror is a little bigger than a human being, 2.4 meters across. The Webb telescope is two and a half times bigger. Uh, that means that at um, the same um, wavelengths, it will have two and a half times better resolution. And at larger wavelengths in the infrared, it will have the same resolution as Hubble has in the optical. Not to drive you nuts, but I will make a point of every web showing in orange and every Hubble in blue. The talk is, of course, mostly about web. Um, so here's our update as of this year. It's a fully deployable six and a half meter telescope with 25 square meter collecting area which is good for receiving lots of photons, uh, designed for infrared imaging and spectroscopy, analyzing the light as a function of wavelength. In this range, it actually runs to 29 micron in wavelength. So this is sort of the longest wavelength you can see by eye. It's orange. Uh, 0.7 is sort of the limit that we experienced as red. And it was launched uh, over a year and a half ago. These five layers of Kapton are the sun shields that keep the ambient temperature at 40 Kelvin. So below this, these five layers is the sun and the earth and the moon, as we'll see at all times. And each layer reduces the temperature from room temperature here or hotter by almost a factor of two, factor of square root of three. And so you go from room temperature here to 40 Kelvins there. Uh, this is important because the Hubble Space Telescope goes around the earth every 96 minutes 
that's 15 sunsets and 15 sunrises a day. It's very tiring on the astronauts, also tiring on the telescope. Um, has had 180,000 sunrises and sunsets in its entire 33 year life. The Webb telescope had exactly one sunrise, namely when the launch fairing opened eight minutes after launch, and one sunset, namely when in January last year, the sun shield deployed. So it's a very, very passive system, much more stable than Hubble. That's very important. And the sky also there is much darker. So it sat in the uh, upper launch cone of the Ariane rocket. It's a European Canadian collaboration with the US as lead, um, nested and folded up like a giant bat. And eight minutes after launch, as you will see these, uh, uh, um, the sun, uh, the launch fairing uh, was uh, ejected and the telescope came out and then over the next couple of weeks it deployed. We were somewhat underweight, which was a good thing. We had a picture perfect launch, which is why we uh, think we might have an operational lifetime longer than 20 years. Um, <clears throat> if this is the Earth, that's the Moon's orbit. And the Earth and the Moon go around the Sun every 365 days. There are five points two of which are stable, where a spacecraft or an asteroid can reside and um, be in sort of equilibrium with the gravity of the Earth and the Sun and the, um, the, uh, the tidal forces. It's called the Lagrange point. So it took two months to travel out here and to deploy. And um, when it got there, it's not sitting still, but it's sort of like constantly climbing onto the top of that gravitational mountain with a little bit propellant used every few weeks. From that vantage point, both the moon and the sun and the earth are always behind the sun shield. That's why we're always so cold. So we don't have 16 sunrises, 16 sunsets a day. One and a half million kilometers from earth, very empty space. It's not like low earth orbit where you have tens of thousands of satellites. We can observe more than 70% of the time. Even if we're always clear here, you could still not observe more than 50% of the time from the Earth or with Hubble because the Earth will be in the way, the Sun will be in the way um, half the time. We don't have that problem with Webb. It's a very efficient observatory. Um, during the deployment, the first thing that happened is that the um, tripod arm with the secondary mirror came down, locked into place with redundant mechanisms, and then two side panels with three of the hexagonal mirrors each folded into place. At that point, we had an almost working telescope. Uh, this was very difficult to build, and you know it's far away from the Earth, so you can't send astronauts out to uh, refurbish it with a space shuttle, so you have to test it on Earth in one gravity and make sure it works 100%. This was done in um, the middle of this last uh, decade, both at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, Northrop, the prime contractor, and uh, in Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, so you will see the mirrors soon in real life, but this is what they look like. 1.35 meters across all 18 of them. I had some conversation with folks who asked very good questions over uh, the reception time. There is six mechanical fingers, we call them hexapods or actuators, these green things behind each mirror that gives each mirror exactly the right shape. It has both a, a push and a pull, a rotation, a tip and a tilt, and a, a radius of curvature, seven free parameters. If each one, one of these gets stuck uh, on each side, the other one will take over and we lose no uh, functionality. So we're very forgiving against failures. This, of course, had to be tested many times. I'll spare you all the details, but here's all the components as they were made. The primary mirror segments, secondary mirror, before it was gold-coded. We use gold not because the project has so much money, but because gold reflects infrared light so well, like a wedding ring, it looks orange because the blue light gets absorbed. The red light reflects off at very high efficiency because there's many of these reflecting mirrors inside the telescope. You can't afford to lose more than 2% of the light at every bounce. Um, all the support structure, instruments, spacecraft, computers, reaction wheels, all built in the last decade uh, after it was designed. This giant sun shield, you can see NASA has its ducks in a row here in front of the sun shield. I've been inside that hole in a, a bunny suit like this. 
it is very impressive. You had no idea that they could make a tennis court size sunshield. By the way, that capped on is just like your kitchen saran wrap, but it's very high refle reflective and very strong. So it was quite an ordeal to design and make all this. And then um, you can thank me, I'll take credit for this part. You can thank me for this one. Uh, John Mather didn't want to do this, but I uh, said, John, what if there's a launch delay and we'll be staring at the ceiling for, you know, five years? Um, can we have mirror covers in the meanwhile? No, we're not going to do that. Well, we have mirror covers anyway. It was a good thing because in January 2016, during the giant snowstorm in Maryland, that was on building 29, the same building where Hubble was uh, tested in the 1980s. There was two Olympic swimming pools worth of water on the roof in the form of snow, and we had cover, so that's good. Um, here you can see how NASA puts on and removes the covers. We have two Olympic divers in bunny suits that take them off <laughs> very carefully. Yeah, it was necessary. Very glad we did that. Mind you that we will look for water in exoplanets, so we do not want to have a single drop of water in our telescope. Yeah, um, This was not the worst water threat we had, as you will see, but Anyway, there's the telescope ready to go on a merry-go-round. You can move it every which way to test it with the guys at Goddard uh, doing the, um, uh, the, the testing. Uh, look at the logo at the wall, the NASA meatball. In the next picture, you can see the team with the, the guy who's cracking the whip here, John Mather, on the left. And you can see the meatball, which is now behind us, reflecting off the mirror. It enlarges. It works. That was our first test. Not the final test we did, but one test we had to do. So we have an enlarging mirror. Good. Um, there it is, ready to go. Just pretty picture. Um, can't resist to show these. This gets a little technical, forgive me, but there is four instruments on board. The Canadian fine guiding sensor that holds two infrared detectors still on two stars in the corners to make sure the telescope doesn't rotate and translate during the long exposures. Then there's Marcia Riki's near-infrared camera. Uh, built at the U of A, a good friend of mine, and two instruments built in Europe, the near-infrared spectrograph, which analyzes the light as function of wavelength, and the mid-infrared instrument that works at longer wavelengths. These three work at 1 to 5 microns, 0 0.9 to 5, and this one works 5 to 29 microns. So this is the long reddish view of the telescope. 27 states in the U.S. have contributed, actually not a complete count, there is more than that, and 16 countries in Europe plus Canada. Uh, that was important to survive politically because there was a number of times that we went over budget, unfortunately. So how you take a spectrum and telescope like this, you all know you want to analyze the light versus color or wavelength so you can um, establish its chemical composition. Well, what you do is you have an, a micro shutter array. These are a half by quarter millimeter little doors you can open and close magnetically. You can make them in any pattern. So if you know you have a star cluster or a cluster of galaxies here, you can open the ones where you know there will be a star or a galaxy behind the shutter, and then you can analyze its light as a cigar from red to blue or blue to red in this case. Um, you can make any pattern you want. You can even make the JWST logo. That wouldn't be very useful, but you could do that. Um, and there's 256,000 of these um, uh, micro shutters. So we tested the whole um, observatory extensively, including the hard, one of the harder parts, getting the secondary mirror down. And they did that vertically in one gravity because they had to make sure the engines, the motors didn't get overloaded. So you see guys here in bunny suits running around. There's even a cable here uh, that goes to the ceiling. You can see that's not because they were cheating in the test. That's to make sure the very lightweight motor didn't burn out in one gravity because it only could do, it had to do this in zero gravity where the forces are much less and you didn't want to do any damage. So that was tested many times, worked like a charm. So then the final test was to make sure we didn't make the same mistake as Hubble in the primary mirror. So what we do is we, we take the telescope, put it in our suitcase. Uh, we didn't fit in an overhead compartment. Um, so we had to put the suitcase, it didn't even fit on an 18 wheeler. It went on a 36 wheeler that take, took two freeway lanes, the whole thing, into a C5 airplane from airport to airport. So here it is in front of Johnson Space Flight Center's um, thermal vacuum chamber. This 14 meter door, you can see a human being here, was used, the same thing, in the 1960s to test the moon landers and the Apollo capsules, not the whole Saturn V. And so 
we were shoveled with on rails into that chamber. We cabled everything up after the telescope was constructed. We removed the technicians, we closed the door, we pumped it down to almost vacuum and we cooled it to 40 kelvins with a giant helium shroud. And then we were testing it for about two or three months to make sure everything would work the way we expected it to work in 40 kelvins. This was in June of 2017, the test was going on. Unfortunately, during Hurricane Harvey in Houston in 2017, a number of the technicians lost their houses. It was about a cubic kilometer worth of water flowing by this building, but the telescope itself fortunately was not damaged or collect any water. Then the hardest part was certainly to test the sun shield. They had these mechanical booms that pull it out and then these vertical booms along these spreader bars that would push it up vertically. That got stuck once or twice, but after five times they had that down to an arch. They also dropped some bolts on the floor, as you might have heard. They had to find out where they came from and make sure they didn't make that mistake again. So here the telescope gets made it with the observatory and there is the complete package, not quite fully folded up, ready to go for launch. That was now four years ago. Um, then there were some last minute shaking done to make sure we would survive the launch where it was. It was actually the most dangerous part of the whole operation other than launch itself. We would move it on a giant cart from one building to another um, at uh, um, um, Northrop's compound in the Redondo Beach. And if there had been an earthquake, then that would not have been good. So they <clears throat> bolted it on the table. They started shaking it and acoustic, you know, there's uh, mechanisms in here that make the same noise as an uh, uh, engine of a 747, which is how loud a launch is. And you want to make sure that nothing inside breaks. All went well, but there was an earthquake when we were mounted on the table. It was a Richter 4, the El Monte Rick, uh, Richter 4 of August 2020, but it didn't matter, we were fine. Um, anyway, there it is, ready to be launched, ready to go, fully tested. That was uh, two years ago, this last month. Um, anyway, yeah, this month, two years ago. On a boat through the Panama Canal from uh, San Pedro to uh, Kourou, uh, north of Brazil in French Guiana, mounted on the rocket and launched on Christmas Day. A wonderful Christmas present indeed. The French and the, uh, well, it's really a whole European com uh, company that uh, did uh, the launch. This was, I think, their 125th launch. They really had it down to an art. So there is the last real picture of the telescope uh, over the Horn of Africa here, uh, eight minutes after launch, um, with the onboard camera from the Ariane vehicle. V very soon thereafter, the uh, um, solar um, um, array would deploy and then eventually also the sun shield. So a few months later, on the way to L2, we took our first selfie where each one of these mirrors took a picture of a star, the same star, but many of them didn't look so good. If you see images like this tonight in your telescope, you yeah, there's something out of focus. Of course it was because you know, we hadn't cooled down completely yet and we needed to adjust the focus with the hexapods. So that was done in various steps, improving and improving over time. And eventually we had all 18 mirrors aligned properly and stacked on top of each other. And that was our first image of first star. There it is. Uh, some friends of mine made this image, including Mike Mensel. These were mostly planetary astronomers. They were interested in stars, but they couldn't get over it how many faint and distant galaxies they saw behind their focus image. So the distant galaxies were probably, well, in my mind anyway, the most exciting thing to do, but we had to get this focus part first. So then we took a family picture of all the cameras, the European near infrared spectrograph, mini infrared imager, the uh, Canadian fine guiding sensor, um, and their uh, near infrared spectrograph that's part of the FGS and then the near infrared camera built at U of A. We pointed at the South Ecliptic Pole at the Large Magellanic Clouds you see thousands of faint stars here um, with indeed in the mid infrared you see more dust than stars. I will get back to that. Um, in the PDF of the talk there's links to all these press releases. This was an earlier image by the Spitzer Space Telescope, a small 80 centimeter to 85 centimeter telescope the early 2000s, the same region here with Webb. So it helps to go from you know, less than a meter to six and a half meters. You get enormously better resolution and sensitivity. And you can see the dust filaments between the stars much better. Um, so thank you uh, for everyone who contributed to Webb. This was our first test of the 
um, multi-slit spectrograph. The NIRSPAC took a spectra of hundreds of faint stars in the galactic center. And indeed, you can see from blue to red, they show all the features that you expect for these faint old stars. So that worked too. Now we're really ready to look at Webb's uh, first images. This is the Eagle Nebula. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions now, but then we'll run out of time at the end. We could also answer questions after the second half on the science and do it all together. What do you folks want to do? Finish first? Yeah, okay. Now we'll do this, the science part now, and then we'll remember all your questions about the first part. So um, in 1995, the Hubble fixed Whitefield Camera 2 made this gorgeous haunting image of the Eagle Nebula, where bright stars on the top, not sh shown here, are pressing down with their ultraviolet radiation on these light year long filaments of gas and dust. And it's at these pinnacles at the end where new stars are forming. Here you see the same uh, with Webb NERCAM further in the infrared, where look how dusty this is. You can only see two stars here. You see a whole pile of stars behind the dust. So in the infrared, you still see the dust, but you also look through it much more easily. Yeah, this image became part of a US postage stamp in the late 90s. I surely hope there will be more web based postage stamps in the future. This is the mid infrared image of the Eagle Nebula at an angle. And you can see very well here. Again, the bright stars are shining from the top. They're pressing down on this dust. And some of these filaments have been pushed away enough that new stars become revealed over here and there and various other locations. So this is like a cradle of cosmic star formation. Here is a real good rich cradle of multiplets, about 10,000 stars born at the same time out of this giant gas cloud in the Large Magellanic Cloud called 30 Doradus, one of the brightest things you can see in that galaxy, which is now 160,000 light years away. Um, these are very young and massive stars, the kind that explode as supernovae at the end of their lifetimes. This is one of the first uh, images revealed uh, in July last year, um, July 12th to be precise, on the cosmic cliffs of star formation. It's in the Carina Nebula, 7,600 light years away. And again here in all these filaments, I, I think of, of this sort of like, if you wish, a cosmic beachhead of star formation. This is the ocean, that's the sand um, in the ocean of gas, there are all these hot and bright stars that are shining down on this beachhead and out of all this gas and dust here, new stars like the sun over here in particular are forming. Even in the infrared, you cannot look through this pile of dust so easily because it's so dense, excuse me, that went too fast, slightly tilted. The same region as here is now visible here and there, where indeed lots of stars are forming visible at the longer wavelengths through the dust. So I call this uh, the cradle of cosmic star formation, where new stars like the sun are formed. This happens all in the aftermath of bright stars like these folks over here in the future, also this one, shining down on this front of gas and allowing enough dust to evaporate so that stars can form. You see this here in our own good uh, Orion Nebula, the trapezium, I don't know where the trapezium stars are. I don't think uh, these two stars are part of that. But again, sort of a cosmic cliff-like feature here also shown in the mid-infrared. And deeply embedded there is a young star with um, a whole disk of dust surrounding it that is just forming. There is actually a, a carbon component in here called methyl casein. I do not know the precise chemical composition. But these uh, dust and gas clouds contain a lot of chemicals um, that contain carbohydrates, uh, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, other things. Um, when a star is forming, this is a star about 100,000 years old, 30% uh, of the mass of the sun with some uh, phone number here. It is an hourglass shaped nebula, almost 500 light years away. It actually causes an enormous a uh, gas envelope to be illuminated by this young star and some of this gas has been expelled. The star will be rotating in this vertical direction with its rotation axis and eventually form a planetary debris disk 
surrounding from this gas surrounding the star. You can see that more in action um, over here and um, in further slides. This is a dark cloud that's quite close by, the closest stellar nursery that we have imaged with Webb so far, and that's at 456 light years. Again, here also in the thickest part of that gas and dust cloud, new stars are forming like the sun. And one of these stars located over here is squirting out a jet of material because it's spinning so fast. In this cloud, they have observed polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs as we call them, which are complex um, chemical uh, molecules that are building blocks of life, not life itself, but um, change, carbon chains like that make it into um, what is our um, own life uh, on Earth. Um, here's another example of that, a young star forming out of its surrounding star, a gas and dust, with a jet being expelled in both directions, not quite symmetric. And um, all I can say, this is, um, you know, a rather messy process. It's not just a gas cloud collapsing, making a star and a few planets surrounding it. No, there's a lot of inflow and outflow of material. And the whole cloud rotates, which is why it gets this uh, water garden hose type um, uh, features. So when the star starts shining, it's colored in here black because there was actually a mechanical finger, call it cold finger or a coronagraph, blocking the light in the middle here via somewhat complex system. So you could see the surrounding light. This is around nearby star Fomalhaut. If it was bright tonight, you could actually see that by eye. Tonight, you couldn't see this disk because this disk is seen in the mid-infrared. But this is a protoplanetary disk where each one of these ringlets is going to form a giant planet that would become uh, Jupiter and this would become a somewhat lighter planet. Not exactly like our solar system, but similar to it. Here's one scene from the side. Um, at 32 light years distance, the central starlight was blocked. You can very clearly see in the near and mid-infrared that there is a, a young solar system forming there. With planets not around quite just as yet, but soon in um, 100,000 or a million years, they will be there. I'll take a brief look at our own solar system because I know you all came for the planets and the black holes. So this is Mars. Um, this is the image observed with the Mars probe, uh, the MOLA uh, Mars probe launched by NASA many years ago. Uh, this is an image by um, NERCAM at different wavelengths where you can see the lighter um, orangey parts are at higher temperatures and the darker parts are at lower temperatures. The sun is shining this direction on Mars. And this is what allows you then to not only measure the temperature, but also the weather on Mars and also get an idea of what the chemical composition is. You do that with the spectrum where you analyze the amount of light as a function of wavelength, in this case between one and five microns. And lo and behold, you can see that carbon dioxide is quite prevalent on Mars, carbon monoxide, monoxide not so much. Water, not a lot. Most of the water in Mars, if it's there, we think is frozen or tied up under the surface. But this is how you would also measure uh, the content of water or carbon dioxide or even ozone on other planets. You just take a spectrum like this and um, see if the material is there or not. Jupiter, beautiful image, much better than, uh, than Hubble, I would say, with its um, magnetic polar caps over here, north and south pole, and the great red spot, the storm that has been raging ever since Galileo discovered it 400 years ago. So you think we have a problem with hurricanes that last a month or a couple of weeks. Here they last 400 years and counting. Yeah, and they're also twice the size of the Earth. So um, it's a great place to be a weather forecaster. The weather will be the same tomorrow as in 400 years. Um, Okay, Saturn with its rings, uh, a number of moons visible, um, quite neat. Uh, I won't talk about the science of this, just showing that it's so cute. These rings, of course, including the inner rings, some of which were found to be new in other planets, are basically caused by moons that never formed. They failed to form because the tidal forces so close to the planet are too large. This is also visible around Uranus um, with its new Zeta ring. So these are all moons that are close to Uranus that never formed. But there is moons further out, as we will see. And by the way, 
the warmest spot on Uranus, if you ever go that, is the north or south polar cap, because Uranus tilts on, you know, it's tilted on its axis in its orbit around the sun, spins around that axis. So half the time, half the full orbit, um, <coughs> it uh, points the north pole at the sun. Um, this is Neptune, also has rings. So rings are not the exception, they are the rule. They're always far in and they are within where the moons are and basically the debris where moons could not form. That's the brightest moon of Neptune called Triton. And it's brighter than Neptune actually in the infrared because uh, Neptune is made dark by its own methane. It has a methane atmosphere. And there's a close up. You can see a number of its moons and rings here. Beautiful planet. Now let's go to um, some planets around other stars. Here's a star with phone number that I won't pronounce. The star is actually here. Again, its light is suppressed. You can see sort of a circle where the light was taken out. And there's a planet that doesn't look around. That's an optical effect, but in the infrared, mid-infrared kind of looks around. There's a planet, um, 10 Jupiter masses. So it's a heavy one, uh, only 15 million years old around a star. And we can image those directly. We can even take a spectra of such planet uh, in the same wavelength range and look for features like water or carbon um, dioxide. This one has a water atmosphere. The problem is its temperature is uh, a thousand Fahrenheit. So it's steam, not water. Yeah. So if you go there, you can't drink it. Um, anyway, so what happens at the end of the lifetime of a star? Well, massive stars explode. More about that in a minute. Oops. Uh, not so massive stars like the sun, they shed their outer layers. They have burned up all the hydrogen in the center in the outer shells, then they burn up their helium in the center in the outer shells, and then they start expanding past the orbit of the Earth and Jupiter in some cases, and become what we call this planetary nebula. It's not a planet, it's just the dust, the material that the star made in its own nuclear reactions, basically components like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, iron, everything you had for breakfast this morning was made in the star someday. And then that gets deposited in the space surrounding it. And out of this material in the near infrared, the mid infrared, new planets will be formed. Yeah, by the way, hydrogen and helium are the only chemical elements made in the Big Bang. Everything else was made in stars. So you, you do have hydrogen in your body in the form of water. 64% uh, water, mostly oxygen, actually. But all the elements in your body, other than hydrogen and helium, were made inside stars. Yeah, that's why I call this cosmic stardust or the cosmic circle of life. I can't resist sh uh, showing this uh, verse from scripture in Genesis, for dust thou art and to dust thou shalt return. This is true for stars, for planets and for people. Yeah, it's a cosmic process. Um, I'll go on. Some stars become uh, unstable at the end of their lifetime. This is a 30 solar mass star, a real giant. It was spinning fairly fast and it shed out its outer layers before it goes supernova. So stars like the sun just become white dwarfs after they throw out their outer layers. This one will go supernova in a while. Probably not tomorrow, but maybe in 10,000 years. But you can already see the precursor effects of that. Uh, also, a lot of gas and dust is deposited back into the interstellar medium. Here's supernova 1987A. I was a postdoc in Pasadena. I was in Chile when this happened. Uh, in the, was visible in the Large Magellanic Cloud to the unaided eye. Since 1987, that shock front from this exploding star has expanded this far in it because of some hourglass, funny looking nebula of all the material that was expelled by that star. So that I think is, and that's the aftermath of such a ex supernova explosion. This one is in our own galaxy, a couple of hundred light years away. And that's what we call the supernova remnant. Again, that material cosmic recycling gets deposited back into the interstellar medium out of which new stars and planets will be, and maybe people someday um, could form. Now let's look at this, um, the cosmological scales with Einstein's eye. Uh, here is Stefan's Quintet, a collection of five galaxies. 
these spiral galaxies actually in the foreground, but one, two, three, four are at a distance of 40 mega light years. Um, I call it the cosmic train wreck because they're merging and colliding. And while they do that, again, they produce a lot of new stars with the associated dust in the areas surrounding and between them. Uh, this is a relatively small merger. I call it the cosmic fender bender. We will see some more dramatic mergers later on. Um, so four colliding galaxies. The mid-infrared shows how beautiful this gas is being pulled out of these galaxies and form new stars elsewhere. There's also a very bright star-like uh, object seen in this galaxy to the north. You couldn't see it so well here, but at longer wavelengths, it pokes nicely visible through the dust. And this is what I call the beast or the supermassive black hole. I say black hole, it's a region in space where light cannot escape, velocity of uh, escape velocity larger than the speed of light. How can black hole be so bright? Well, because the area immediately surrounding it um, can have the brightness of many uh, billions of suns. It can even become brighter than the galaxy. And you see that here. I have some more blatant examples of that. This is an <coughs> ordinary galaxy like our own. Sun would be here somewhere. Now you see it in the mid infrared with all the <coughs> dust lanes. Uh, following the spiral arms, and the sun would be in one of these arms, if it were that galaxy. But here's another galaxy that has a bright nucleus, where indeed there is a central monster, a supermassive black hole, in this case about um, <clears throat> 10 million solar masses, like our own galaxy, that is shining brightly because all, all the material that's falling into the black hole makes the surrounding area extremely bright. You can see an even more pronounced example, um, this NGC 7469, 220 million light years. And indeed, a supermassive black hole is feasting here on the infalling gas. And so this is a complex process where both gas falls into the black hole. And at the same time, if the black hole spins fast enough, uh, gas can be thrown out at very, uh, not out, not inside, the Schwarzschild radius, but gas can be blown out the area surrounding the black hole. Just for the record, such areas are not large. I have charts in the spares on that. They're about the size of Pluto's orbit, so 40 astronomical units, a bit bigger than the Earth's orbit. And they contain maximally brightness of 10 to the 14, so 100 trillion solar luminosities. Now, last time we went to Pluto, with the New Horizons spacecraft and look back at the sun, we saw one star. So imagine you go to Pluto, you look back, and you see 100 trillion stars worth of brightness. That's what that is. Good place to get a suntan. Yeah, um, don't get too close. All right, so what Einstein predicted in relativity all these things, right? Black holes, gravitational lensing, the expansion of the universe, the cosmological constant or dark energy. Yet he doubted them 100 years ago, but he had it right in every regard, and he predicted everything correctly, as we will see. So here's an ordinary set of galaxies. It came out in a paper last year. There's also a poster in the hallway and a press release um, on my list of references. An uh, elliptical galaxy in the background. It's about the redshift of 0 0.05, which is a couple of hundred million light years away. And this spiral galaxy, like our own, is right in front but they're not so close together in space that they're interacting tidally. Elliptical rather than these background galaxies here is rather symmetric in shape. So we use the light on this side to predict how much light there would be in the background galaxy here. And then we measure precisely how much dust there is in these spiral arms. And that gives us similar, but not identical answers as we see in our own galaxy. So we use the elliptical as a backlight here in this overlapping pair. We also saw enlarged here around the center of the elliptical galaxy. And by the way, each of these galaxies is anywhere between 100 billion and a trillion stars worth of mass, so quite sizable. Um, there is a galaxy here in the background behind this elliptical. It's really over here somewhere, but because of the enormous mass of the elliptical, 10 to the 12 solar masses, this galaxy gets stretched into a gravitational arc. Not only that, a counter image appears on the other side. So the galaxy is really behind the elliptical here somewhere, but the light comes out this way 
and that way we call that gravitational lensing. Einstein predicted it, and here we observe it. Yeah, a very common effect. This was the image released by President Biden on July 11 last year, uh, the 12-hour web deep image on the uh, SMAX cluster. I like to show this one because this light was emitted. I want this to sink in four and a half billion years ago. At that time, this galaxy and some of the other ones in this cluster were already nine billion years old. Yeah, so the Earth and the Sun were formed when this light was emitted. These galaxies are today three times older than our Sun. And so we can look at it this way in the cosmic circle of life. We're a bit of an afterthought as a solar system. Here too, and by the way, the total mass of this cluster there's hundreds of galaxies, including this giant one, but there's lots of these low white galaxies, all at the same distance, sort of a third of the way to the edge of the visible universe, the Hubble uh, distance of the universe. Um, it's about 10 to the 15 solar masses. That's a thousand trillion, or more precisely, one star for every penny in the national debt, more or less. Yeah, that's a large number. Um, I, I used to be able to say, you know, one star for every massive galaxy when the, that was a trillion. Now we're at many trillions, so it's one star for every penny. But it's an enormous number of stars in this cluster spread over hundreds of galaxies. Each of these galaxies typically 50 or 100,000 years, uh, light years across. And because of that enormous pile of mass in the middle, objects in the background, like an ordinary spiral like that, get stretched and spaghettified into these arcs. That's the gravitational lensing that Einstein predicted. And from the curvature of these arcs, which is basically the curvature of space around that cluster, you can calculate how much mass there is. So Einstein got it exactly right. By the way, that's the Hubble image of the same cluster. I think we made some progress. Um, yeah, but Hubble's seen some of this before, and Hubble's data is valuable because it's all in the blue. Uh, now, here's another lensing cluster by one of my friends and colleagues, Dan Coe, and his uh, postdoc, uh, about equally massive. And it made three images of what appears to be one galaxy seen on the different angles at these different spots. That's actually a double galaxy, a bluer and a redder one, kind of the same material. That really is located behind here, but there's three different light paths around this massive cluster. And this single well, double galaxy is seen 400 million years after the Big Bang. Yeah, so it's seen 13.3 or so billion years in the past. And it's not seen once, but it's seen three times. That's actually fairly common. Well, we haven't seen too many of these at such large distances, but this gives us then a greatly enhanced and magnified because of the spaghetti type stretching, it's an enhanced view of what was happening there in the first 400 billion years. And yes, galaxies were already forming. Here's another one. This is probably our record. Um, a single star, a redshift 6.2. The redshift measures how much the universe has expanded since then. The answer is, you know, one plus six is 7.2 times. So the universe was roughly 14 times younger back then or a billion years old. Again, here, a small galaxy like, you know, one of these things got highly stretched because of the outskirts of this cluster. And these stretched parts come typically in symmetric parts, a star cluster here, star cluster there. And there was a single star in the middle that happened to fall right along what we call the critical curve, where at the distance of that, you know, first billion years behind the cluster, there is literally an infinity surface if you're located there, you can be magnified almost an infinite number of times. This star would have ordinarily been uh, more than a factor of 100,000 below even Webb's detection limit. But because it is in this sweet spot with a good model and precise data, you can say, well, it must be a star. It's actually a double star. Um, <clears throat> it has a companion and it has uh, temperatures of 10 and 20,000 degrees for each of the two stars. And so we're now beginning to see individual stars in the first part of the universe. There's also a poster of this outside. This is unpublished yet, but we just submitted the paper. There's already a press release on it. Another lensing cluster with this phone number 
redshift 0.35, so about 4 billion years in the past. The cute thing about this is it was selected to have a big pile of dusty star forming objects behind it. And indeed, the spaghettified images show the core of an ordinary galaxy like that, three times repeated, three different light paths. Not only that, there was a supernova explosion here and there and there, the same supernova seen three times. As soon as we showed this image to colleagues, including Nobel laureate Dan Rees, you should invite him sometimes, they wanted to know if we could measure the expansion rate of the universe this way, the Hubble constant, because there's three different light paths of that supernova, which happened here somewhere, or light path that way, that way, and that way. From the time delay in which the supernova brightens and fades, we could try to estimate the Hubble constant back at that redshift where the universe was almost three times smaller than today. We don't know the answer yet. Our teams are working on it, including Adam Reason. We hope to get a consistent answer. But this is probably one of our most dramatic discoveries. As soon as the paper is accepted, we'll do a press release on it. This one came out in August. You might have seen the release. This is the El Gordo cluster, the most massive cluster known, a couple of times 10 to the 15 solar masses, with very highly stretched objects um, due to its gravity, including one that looks like a fish hook. We call it El Anzuelo or Einstein's fish hook. This pile of galaxies here really bends the light of an ordinary dusty spiral galaxy into this wonderful uh, stretched shape. That then means you can, over very many pixels, um, study the shape of that original galaxy and see what it would have looked like. So this is what we observe. Um, El Anzuelo, Einstein's fish hook. And we think that this little um, butterfly looking thing um, in the, to the right is what caused this lensed image. So the real galaxy would look like that and the magnification of that cluster would have turned it into this fish hook. You should read the press release, also the ASU version of it, because there was um, a fellow that approached me after a talk like this in November. He said, Roger, I'm um, 92 years old and I'm a Holocaust survivor. I grew up as a kid in Princeton and I met Albert Einstein in person. Yeah, his name was um, Werner Salinger, and uh, that is featured on the ASU version of the press release. Uh, here's our last image. We're currently working on a release on that. It's also in the hallway. A very massive cluster, highly elongated with many galaxies uh, that also uh, gravitationally lenses many stretched objects in the background. Uh, this image is so impressive, especially when you look at it in the dark with only a little light from the side because it has not only 20 hours of web data folded into it, but 100 hours of Hubble data. And the Hubble data makes the nearby galaxies look really blue and the distant highly redshifted galaxies look really red. This, by the way, is a quasar. It's very dusty and very red at high redshift. That's visible in the corner here. I'm gonna leave it at that for the sake of time. So I'll give you my conclusions. I have said most of this I know we might have gone over time a little bit and it was overwhelming with so many images, but let me just say this. We're observing the first light um, epoch and the galaxy assembly and supermassive black hole growth epoch in detail, um, including the first stars, star clusters, and how galaxies formed and evolved over the last uh, 13 and a half billion years. And of course, we see the cosmic stir circle of life with this generation and recycling of cosmic dust. So we built this telescope for the young generation, some of which are in the audience, and I hope you will use this telescope after you graduate from high school and go to college. So I'll leave it at that, and thank you very much for your attention, and uh, be open for questions. And of course, if, if you need to go, I understand. It's been a late night, but if you have questions, I'm here. Please. In terms of Neptune and spectroscopic measurement of exoplanets, what kind of range would you expect the Neptune to have in mind for the second hundred light years or so? Yeah, so th there's two ways of doing this. Um, 
you can try to see one of these direct planets and take a spectrum. Uh, that's, well, I'll try to find it again, but you've seen that spectrum where the coronagraph su su suppressed the starlight. This is bright enough to take a spectrum, take a very long integration. Another way to do it is in my spare chart. I have no other way to race to it than just do this, but it's at the end here somewhere. Let me see if I find it. Um, yeah, there's two kinds of black holes, babies and cats. I'll get to that. Um, so here's what you do. You have a, uh, oops, not so good. Uh, wrong button. You have a planet go in front of a star, a relatively bright star, and it causes a dip. Yeah, a light dip, usually a percent or two. And during that light dip, you can also analyze the spectrum because the light dip tells you, especially during the what we call the ingress and egress, where the pl planet atmosphere goes in front of the star and exits. If you take spectra during this period many times over, you can see what the uh, molecular content of that atmosphere, such as water, carbon dioxide. Now you find oxygen and ozone, and you have a home run. We are not there yet. Principle, we can do that. Yeah, great question. Yes, please. Yeah, because we need to also slew, right? We have 6,500 kilograms we need to move. The reaction wheels, which spin in the other direction that you want to move the telescope, are 20 kilograms. So it takes a long time to move from one side of the sky to the other side. So the scheduling is in packages, and there is you know, some moving time between commuting, if you want. Yeah, great question. Yes, please. Yeah, I'll try to get to that. years after Big Bang, um, and calculating the Hubble constant for that using the perfect station lensing thing, does that mean that we can use that to calculate the expansion of the universe that far back yeah. and show if it is slowing right. down? We measured the Hubble constant at this redshift when the universe was 2.7 times smaller. And the Hubble constant goes down simply as 1 plus z, so it was higher in the past. Um, but we need to see if that's what we measure. Not quite there yet. We will measure that hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, and, and we hope, of course, that we get the canonical value times 1 plus z, but we may not. It may be that it's a little different. And then, you know, we contribute to, you may know about the Hubble constant tangent. We measure today a different value than at the epoch of uh, recombination, uh, the redshift 1100 when the universe was 400,000 years old. We don't know why there's this discrepancy. There's something still fishy in the expansion. Great question. Other questions? Yes, please. Um, yeah, the reionization is uh, is a difficult topic. I'll talk about it some more tomorrow. Great question. Um, what you're trying to do there is to measure the photons that ionize the hydrogen, right? The hydrogen during the Big Bang was just protons and electrons that needed to combine. But after 400,000 years of expansion, the universe was cool enough, 3,000 degrees, you could form the hydrogen. And then it was sitting there doing nothing for maybe 100, 200 million years until the first star started shining ionizing that hydrogen again, which we call reionization. And we can measure the photons that do that, but only in the ultraviolet. Now, the, it's not an ultraviolet telescope, but at the higher redshift, that ultraviolet is um, measurable with Webb. But there is intervening gas that makes this measurement harder. It's tricky business. But tomorrow's talk will be about it. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, sure, please. Give my novice question here. I think you said these three supernova were the same. Yeah, it's this. Is, is this lensing this bulb that we're looking at here? Is that actually those three supernova? Is it behind this cluster? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you want to disentangle, de lens this if you wish. It would be a galaxy just like that, not this one, with a supernova going off, you know, maybe this far from the center. There's the center, there's the supernova. You now place this galaxy here. Because of the enormous mass pile, the light escapes in this direction, that direction, 
in that direction. The supernova appears three times. And we have observed it three times at different epochs. So we, now we have nine data points on the light curve. We know that it's, a, it's the, you know, sort of the, the one we want, the type 1As that understand it candles. Yeah, great question. Yes. Gold. Yeah. And you said that they would give off a red light. They reflect the red light. Yes, that. They the yes, light? they do. Okay. Um, the, how does a star show up whenever they reflect that light out? Uh, because the stars not only emit visible light that you and I can see with our eyes, which is basically you know the whole rainbow from blue to red, but also beyond the red, which we call the infrared. And that light is a little cooler than what the eye can see. It's not as warm as what the sun produces, except when we go to these very early epochs in the universe, these what we call the large redshifts, that light is stretched so far from the ultraviolet optical that it's visible in the infrared. So you really need to make a telescope like this that is infrared sensitive to see it. Yeah? Great question. Yeah, try to get. That uh, yeah, that's a great question. We don't actually know. Let me see here. It, it may be a projection effect. The way you're looking at it, if you let's say you have, in, in the fog, you're messing with the garden hose and you shine a light on the fog, you shine the garden hose coming out of your hose this direction. You'll see something different if you look at it this way rather than from the other side, the recipient of the hose. So there is some foreshortening here that is more advantageous in this direction than that direction. It could be still a similar shape. There's no real evidence that this rather straight jet is wobbling or processing. Sometimes you see that, but not here. Can you detect the wobble if there's one? You could if, if you see, uh, you know, some, some kinkiness in the jet, but it's all straight in this case. But there are other jets that have wobbles to it. Ah, we have a, a KA band uh, transmitter and receiver on board, which is 28 gigahertz. But we talked to three ground stations, Goldstone, California, Tidbin Villa, Canberra, Australia, and uh, Madrid in Spain. Um, each eight hours a day, and they dump that at a speed of 270 gigabits. Um, the radio? Yeah, yeah, it's radio. Yeah, microwave, really. Yeah, 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 it works well. It's a fairly common way of transmitting to uh, spacecraft. Great question. Yes, please. Would you say about the expansion of the universe? Do you think it's accelerating? Or? It's definitely accelerating. We've known that for um, you know, over 20 years, uh, Adam Reeve, 25 years. And Saul Perlmutter and Bernard Schmidt got the Nobel Prize for that, all based on these supernovae saying, hey, they, we know that these things nearby have this kind of standard brightness. That's how they produce their um, explosive thermonuclear reactions. And we can use them as a standard candle to measure the expansion. So the, the accelerated expansion is, is, is well established. It's also seen in the microwave background at the same amount. At the 5 10% level, things are not entirely kosher. The Hubble constant. Yeah, over there, please. What questions do I have that I want to observe? Well, I want to see the first stars that consist purely of hydrogen and helium. So what I hope to do is actually we're doing that right now in this cluster. We haven't found any yet, although we might soon. So this last image was also taken in three epochs, and you can see the various diffraction spikes from those epochs here. Um, so we have it observed three times, and we hope to find, like Arendelle, the morning star, redshift six, we hope to find some of those at further redshift. We now have a spectrum for Arendelle. We know it's a double star. There's no question about it. We can do this at larger redshifts, redshift 10, 12, but universe is three, 400 million years old. Then we might be actually seeing some of the first stars individually. But that will take long observations to make sure we actually get lucky and see one. These things are like fireflies in the night. Because again, they're almost a factor of 10,000 dimmer than the telescope can see. 
but once they move across that infinity line of surface, they're for a couple of months get 10,000 times brighter. And that's how we've seen this more nearby, even with Hubble. Um, and we now see that redshift six with Webb, but we hope to push that to farther redshifts. Yeah? Webb was built to do the first light, so that is you know, like these first stars. Yeah, let's see. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, dark matter is one of the big questions next to dark energy. Dark energy, of course, drives the exponential expansion of the universe. Dark matter is the stuff that holds all these galaxies together. There's five times more invisible matter known, as you know, in here than we can measure with our telescope. We have ways of, of constraining the dark matter. It gets a bit technical, but we think they're very light particles that are left over from the Big Bang exceedingly low energy 10 to the minus 22 electron volt that only have gravity but because they're such low energy they have what we call in physics the de Broglie wavelength that's the size of a small galaxy that means they would actually affect the formation of the small galaxies and that's what we're looking for if that theorem is right yes um so you said that that morning star was a double star right yeah uh, yeah, I, I left all the technical stuff out. So we, we took a spectrum, and you know, the star looks either hot, where it peaks in the ultraviolet, or it looks red, where it peaks in the, in the red. The temperatures, you know, 30 to 5 or 10,000 degrees. And here we saw a camel hump shaped spectrum. I'll describe it that way. And there was no other explanation that we're dealing with two different temperatures. We know that the scale of this infinity line, we call it the caustic, is so small that it cannot be a star cluster. It cannot be a highly magnified star cluster. It has to be a very highly magnified single star or closed double star. Yeah. In addition to the Earth, has oxygen been found anywhere else in the universe? Uh, yes, it has. Um, not yet with Webb, as far as I know. This is not my area of specialty, but with submillimeter telescopes, we have found carbon monoxide, the molecule, which obviously contains oxygen in it. That's not pure oxygen, but you can also see pure oxygen in other features in spiral galaxies as part of star formation. You sometimes see that stars illuminate gas clouds where single atomic oxygen spectral lines are visible. So yes, oxygen is known. But I'm not aware of, of a pure oxygen spectrum having been found in an exoplanet. It would look something like this, like I had here. I'll get to that. So here you see, oops, hard time, these buttons. So that's a water feature. That's a carbon monoxide feature. There's two of them here. There's a water feature. And a little further in the red and also in the blue is an oxygen feature. It's not shown here. It's, it's rather dim. but. If you find that in one of these transiting exoplanets, then you have a bingo. It doesn't prove that there is life yet, but if you find oxygen, that's a good sign. Now, if you find ozone, which you can also find, but that's even harder still, then you think, well, how is ozone made? Plant life, right? So that will be a real good one, but we're not there yet. But there's big programs going on to do exactly a lot of this on the most promising exoplanets in the hope that we will find one with oxygen on it. Yeah, great question. Any others? Yes, please. Well, the typical web exposure time is half an hour to an hour, but we repeat that a number of times over to get rid of artifacts and other things we discussed over the reception. Yeah, so a couple of hours per filter, typically. We take two filters at once, so we got a bit of a whammy there, and also two modules at once. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned before um, that an, uh, an object is, I want to clarify, can yeah. an object, can we observe an object in and out of that infinity line, or would it expand? Yeah, yeah, because the, the infinity line has a very highly curved surface. I mean, I liken it to, you know, I, I, I used to take my kids to Walmart and there was a big coin well in the entrance. Have you seen a coin well? You take dimes or you know, 
pennies, which is cheaper. And you let, let them go into the coin well. That's also how a black hole accretes its mass. But light follows kind of the same path. And uh, under the right angle, this light ray can go around and around. You can get it to your eye from all kinds of angles. And that's that surface where that happens is called the caustic. And that's where the magnification is almost infinite, not quite. You can't have that quantum mechanically, but you can have it very large. But it's so thin that, yep. like, as a star moves through its galaxy, Yes, exactly. We wrote a paper on this a couple of years ago. And it, it takes typically a couple of months to flare up by a factor of 10,000. And it can be nothing else than that. It can be a supernova. It doesn't flare up like that. Yeah. <clears throat> Great questions. Sorry, I missed. Yeah, go ahead. Ah. Ah, that's a very good question. I'd say a couple of dozen. A couple of dozen. Yeah. Many. That's why I say, you know, don't drink out of that fire hydrant or Niagara Falls. It's overwhelming. <laughs> But, you know, one or two photographs is enough for dissertation. So if you want to do a PhD, I'll, I'll give you one or two f photographs and you'll be set. Well, yep. Sorry, I didn't quite get it. Oh, uh, well, the, the, the light, uh, the, the radio wave from the telescope travels to Earth over one and a half million kilometers. That takes five six light seconds. Yeah, is that what, was that what you're asking? The telescope itself. The telescope. Oh, and the telescope itself moves, yeah, typically at the Earth's orbital speed, 30 kilometers a second. Yeah, so it, it goes with the Earth around the sun at that speed. It, need, it needs to catch up with the Earth. Yeah, good question. Well, it can take up to 13.8 billion years because that's how old the current universe is. But then you need to find something that's that's far away. The furthest thing we found is maybe 13.6 or 13.5 billion years. But that's still a long time to travel, three times as old as the Earth, you know. Yeah. Yes, please. A lot of the expense of JWST was getting this four gummy structure. Yeah, yeah. With the advent of larger launch vehicles and larger crowds, perhaps are there plans for JWST follow up projects? Well, yeah, less expensive is always a hot button. I'm trying to get back to my. Uh, of course, you always yeah. want the latest capability in developing yeah. the latest capability is always expensive. Yeah. So here you've got 12 in the middle panel and three on each side. But you don't have to build it that way. This is basically 18. You could make an outer ring of 18 more. You could have 36 and fold it twice. <coughs> and that will fit in the heavy lifters. So the next generation that these young kids here need to build for us will take 20 years. They will be 36 mirrors or more. Yeah? Are there any actual plans? Or there are plans, but... They try to do some smaller things first because these big projects tend to you know, make an enormous dent in the budget. Yes, more questions there. Yep. Because it collects a lot of light when it's so big and the resolution, the smallest thing you can see becomes better and smaller when you have a bigger telescope. So it, it needed to be this size or it wouldn't do what we intended it to do. Yeah. Good question. Yes, please. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Tom can send that around to everybody if he has an email list, but it's on the second page. It's a long, ugly university thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm not much of a web maker. Well, web telescopes, yes. Web pages, no. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. One more question there. Well, I think that's the next generation. You you don't launch it once. You launch a whole bunch of rockets to the space station, and you put it together there with astronauts, and then you send it over to L2. That, that would be probably the way to make the next generation. I hear that Chinese are building a small version of Hubble, 1.8 meters, 
and they send it to their own space station and assemble it there before they make it operational. That is interesting. It would save you having astronauts go up with shuttles. But that also means you get uh, space stations actually very dirty environments, right? There be a lot of outgassing, a lot of you know toilets that get dumped in space, and you don't want that close to your telescope. Yeah. Uh, just like the Earth, 365 days. We go with the Earth. Yeah, we're sort of a prisoner of the Earth gravitationally. Yeah, yeah good question, though. Okay, last one. How can I'm a How can JWST measure Earth? Yeah, uh, so there's the last one or two charts I showed in the end. Sorry about all this. You can browse through the ch uh, charts yourself. No easy way to go there other than this way. Um, it, it basically does this thing of, of taking either an image, a direct image of a protoplanetary disk that has uh, planets in the make, or it takes a spectrum like this, where um, it first measures the dip in the total light, and then during certain phases, it measures the, the spectrum, which becomes the chemical composition of that ring that's blocking the, star, the starlight, basically the atmosphere of the planet blocking the starlight. Yeah? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I, I also have that in the in the spare charts, I think. Hang on. So, let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Yeah, feel, yeah, feel free to take a picture. Um, All of this is public, so there's no so we're, limit. We've checked out the sky as we did cloudiness and then observing after the talk that come out on another Friday in two years. Um, I think if, if people have a few extra questions, I think Roger would be... Yeah, be happy to answer them. Yeah, you guys had great questions, yeah, folks. So thanks for coming yeah. out, and uh, come back and see us on the first week. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you.